speakers who have sent registered, recorded um, films of their presentation. And uh, the reason why we fund it this way is that we guarantee a very high quality of the, uh, of the recording, probably better than we would get via Zoom. And uh, I think this is quite a good solution. It's less, less risky and less worris worrisome for us organizers. So I'm going to pass straight away at, uh, to, the, to the first uh, presentation, which is um, an explanatory power of the structured atom model uh, by Andreas Otte. Um, but I think it's actually presented by uh, our friend um, Mr. Kale, is that right? Can, can you uh, uh, correct me there? Edo Kyle, sorry, thank you very much for the correct pronunciation. Anyway, both of them uh, come out, the recordings are quite good, so I think we'll go straight away to, to that. Hello to everyone oh, in CC. I wish very much I could oh, be there oh, with oh, you. Oh, sorry. The explanatory power of the structured atom model. The case for new elements. Presented by the SAM team. This talk is about the structured atom model, or SAM for short. The theme of this talk is based on the model allowing or permitting new or unknown elements. During this presentation, we will look at ways to characterize elements according to SAM and define an element number suited to the model. This step opens up room in our new PTE for new, previously unknown elements. It also allows us to explain the observed neutron to proton ratio and double beta decay as an example. But first, we will have a look at who the members of the SAM team are and what we do. The core SAM team consists of J. E. Karl, J. A. Sorensen, J. G. Emming, and A. Otte. For the first 10 years, Edo Karl developed the model alone. Starting from 2015, he showed his first results in backrooms of conferences and gathered interested people. He then moved to the center stage of those conferences and presented at workshops and public events of other scientific communities. Our background is primarily in electrical and chemical engineering as well as information technology. We are therefore outsiders to the field of nuclear physics. But we think that being an outsider is an essential prerequisite to do real revolutionary progress in science. Our approach to the nucleus is more of an observational, geometrical and logical nature. It became clear to us that we need to publish the model as complete as necessary to make interested parties understand the full scope of what is done in the model. Not everything is completely fleshed out yet, but we felt there was enough material to go public. As a consequence, a book called The Nature of the Atom was written by the team, which has just become available. The owner of the model is a foundation based in the Netherlands. It manages all matters related to the structured atom model. The foundation promotes collaboration between scientists and scientific institutes and supports fundamental and analytical research and experiments. After writing and publishing the book, the current main goal of the foundation is to find collaborating parties for experiments. Experiments are envisioned that will lead to falsification or validation of SAM and increase the predictive capability of the model. Enough on the introduction. Back to the model itself and the topic of this talk. First, some basics. In SAM, the conventionally known neutron is redefined as a combination of a proton and an electron, or a proton-electron pair, PEP for short. It is not fundamental on the same level as the proton and the electron. We reintroduce the electron and with it negative charge into the nucleus. The inner electrons act as glue that binds the protons together in a fixed structure based on the concept and the rules of theoretical dense packing. The nucleus adheres to the concept of spherical dense packing, meaning the nucleus attempts to occupy a sphere as small as possible or squeeze as many protons as possible in the available volume. The denser the packing, 
the more energy is released. This mechanism at work leads to the shapes shown here from hydrogen on the left to carbon on the right. The growth pattern after carbon changes. The growth starts at two new locations on the initial carbon and repeats the dense packing pattern until carbon is reached again. The active endings with their structure also determine the outer electron structure as it is related to the distribution of open connection points on the nucleus. The icosahedron structure of carbon has two growth points in very specific positions. We will look at those positions later on. The structures created on top of the icosahedron are also very specific. A new growth point is first covered with a two ending, a deuteron, then a four ending, a squash tetrahedron structure of two deuterons, and finally a five ending, a four ending plus a pep. If all growth points of a nucleus are kept with four or five endings, the element is noble. See the picture of the neon 20 nucleus as an example. After the capping phase, the building phase starts with the lithium ending, which contains three deuterons. The beryllium ending with four deuterons, the boron ending with five deuterons, and finally carbon again, this time with five deuterons and a single proton. This is a depiction of the classic periodic table of elements with pictures of the same nuclei of the elements. The first three rows show the so-called cycle of eight in its clearest form. The elements, when ordered as in the PTE, show similar properties in the columns. But starting from the fourth row, the cycle of eight breaks down. This happens because now the nucleus grows at several places at once. Helium represents zero capped icosahedrons. Neon represents one completely capped icosahedron. Argon represents two and krypton at the end of the fourth row represents already five completely capped icosahedrons. This step from two to five is a clear indicator for parallel growth. We need to look at the backbone of the nuclei. Heavier elements have at their base a combination of multiple icosahedron structures sharing a connecting pep. As a consequence, the growing nucleus creates a backbone of connected icosahedrons in a fractal pattern. The structure branches out as well as elongates to prevent colliding branches as long as possible. Because of the positioning of the growth points, the overall structure has an active top side and an inert backside. The connection between the icosahedrons is made, as already mentioned, by a shared PEP. A secondary icosahedron, therefore, provides only 11 protons or 5 deuterons and a single proton. This results in a strange effect. In SAM, the ratio of neutrons to protons in base configurations of heavier elements is less than 1, not higher. Why this is actually not the case, we will find out later in this talk. The geometry of the backbone is determined by the positioning of the growth points. The angle is an unusual roughly 31.5 degrees because of the top gap created by the first deuteron attaching to the icosahedron structure. Furthermore, the growth point is tilted and rotated by 36 degrees. Also with the structure in mind, it becomes clear that simply counting protons and outer electrons is not enough to identify elements uniquely. We can think of different endings providing the same number of protons and outer electrons. Another observation. Argon was represented by two capped icosahedrons, krypton by five. What happened to three and four? The same issue with xenon which is represented by eight capped icosahedrons. What happened to six and seven? And it gets worse. Radon is represented by 14 capped icosahedrons. Could those missing configurations of completely capped icosahedrons exist? Are we missing elements? To get at least some understanding of the order of elements, 
we first try to count deuterons and single protons. This is closest to the proton count of the standard model, and this number should be equal to the number of outer electrons. Silicon is the first element with an additional carbon structure. Therefore, we see 13 deuterons and one single proton, offset by 14 outer electrons. The next element, however, phosphorus, already causes a problem. We count 15 deuterons and a single proton, offset by 16 outer electrons, which is one too many. We think what happens is the following. When there is enough structure on top of an icosahedron, the single proton it contains can pull in an outer electron to become a pseudopep. With enough structure available, it is possible to hold an electron in a position close to the nucleus. We call this pulled-in electron a quasi-inner electron. This changes the numbers to 15 deuterons and 15 outer electrons as it should be. The combination of a single proton and quasi-inner electron can no longer be counted as a proton as it is more like a PEP. We count as atomic number, therefore, the number of deuterons plus the number of single protons not able to pull in an outer electron to become a quasi-inner electron. Silicon was such a case. Not enough structure, therefore no electron could be pulled in and kept in place. Another question. Do we miss an element with 14 deuterons and a single proton? When the nucleus gets bigger, another effect kicks in. The branches themselves create enough structure to pull in even more outer electrons to become quasi-inner electrons and create even more pseudopeps. Those additional quasi-inner electrons no longer offset the single protons. The branches just provide space to create a deuteron-deuteron connection through this pulled-in electron. Do we count those deuterons affected in our atomic number or not? We decided to still count those as deuterons. It is precisely this step which opens room for more elements, because we still count the number of outer electrons of an atom as the number of deuterons plus the number of single protons minus the number of quasi-inner electrons. Using this approach, we now have multiple empty places in the PTE, not unlike Mendeleev's first periodic table, meaning the model predicts configurations that represent new elements. We therefore must differentiate between the atomic number of an element and the PEP proton count. A deuteron therein counts as one PEP and one proton unless it is offset by a quasi-inner electron pulled in by the branches. Then it counts as two PEPs. This creates the PEP or neutron to proton ratio we actually observe and measure. Let's look at an example. Silver 107 has 49 deuterons six single protons and three PEPs by a first initial count gathered from the model of the silver nucleus. This means there are initially 52 inner electrons. Based on the structure, the nucleus can pull in eight outer electrons, making them quasi-inner electrons. The number of outer electrons is calculated as 49 plus 6 minus 8, equal to 47. The ratio is therefore 49 plus 3 plus 8, divided by 49 plus 6 minus 8, equal to 60 divided by 47. The atomic number is 49 plus 6 minus 0, equal to 55. The atomic number no longer corresponds to the number of outer electrons. It is our conclusion, based on the model, that the structure of the nucleus also determines the configuration of the outer electrons. When we look at the current shell model, for outer electrons, we notice exceptions, situations where the model does not match reality. One good example is copper. Here, the 3D orbital is unexpectedly filled before 4S, compared to nickel, the element right before copper. The completion of the third and the fourth carbon nuclet does not happen in sequence due to the growth process taking place in a parallel fashion. Overall, Copper looks to be close to an unknown noble element with four completely capped carbon nuclets. In SAM, we would therefore expect 3D to be filled before 4S. The orbitals 
are in essence a remaining piece of the cycle of eight idea taken beyond the point of its breakdown, the transition metals. If the structure of the nucleus determines the outer electron configuration, we can ask another question. Could other outer electron configurations exist, having the same number of outer electrons but different distributions in the orbitals? If so, it would mean that they would be caused by different nucleus configurations. What does this all mean for the possibility that new elements may be discovered? There seem to be several classes. First, a new element covering a non-occupied number in the numbering system we created. Second, a known element number but different deuteron, single proton, quasi inner electron distribution. Third, a known element number, same deuteron, single proton distribution, but different endings. Let's look at some examples. First, the case of missing noble gases. We missed two in row four and two in row five. Here we see the structure based on the rules of constructing nuclei in SAM. Row six shows five missing noble gas configurations. Row seven has just one before the overall atomic structure ends because of colliding branches. There are at least two reasons why we do not see those elements in nature. First, the building phase is preferred over the capping phase. On one end, the building phase starts before the capping on another is complete. Therefore, the fully capped configuration is skipped. Second, it might be unstable. Second example, the missing new element with 14 deuterons. It shows a lithium nuclet, three deuterons to the left and a full carbon, five deuterons plus one single proton, to the right on top of the initial carbon, six deuterons. We think this configuration can initially pull in an outer electron, so it would be a 14 plus one minus one, but then cannot hold it in place. The configuration is unstable, the lithium nuclet disintegrates, a proton combines with the quasi inner electron and creates an actual PEP, leaving us with 13 deuterons, a single proton and two PEPs, which equals to silicon 29. Third example. The configuration for sulfur on the left is showing an oxygen-like ending, which makes sense as sulfur is part of the oxygen group. It is a 15 plus 1 minus 0 configuration. But there is another possibility. The configuration to the right with 16 deuterons. So 16 plus 0 minus 0. It looks viable and stable. It might even be possible to create it from phosphorus 32. The fourth example looks into scandium. Scandium is an odd case. It is separated by an unusual number of five nucleons from calcium, the prior element and it comes with just one natural isotope. If we look at our numbering system, we find calcium with number 20 and scandium with number 21. But there are at least two unstable elements also with numbers 20 and 21 positioned between calcium and scandium. The next element after scandium with number 22 is also a new unstable element and it decays to a stable form with the number 21, which is scandium. If we follow the basic rules described before and we take all observations into account, the following atomic nuclei elements with the isotopes emerge, as we can see in this animation from hydrogen to americium. The colors signify repeating patterns, not material change. All the theories are protons. Inner electrons are not shown in the animation. And this is a new PTE based on SAM with 42 columns. The number of columns caused mainly, but not completely, by folding in the lanthanides and the actinides into the sequence. Overall, we can create at least one configuration for each number in our new counting system, which is not yet covered by known elements. Most of those new elements will be unstable though. There might be stable new elements out there which nature simply skipped or are in very low abundance. Others might be unstable, but with a half-life longer than a few seconds.
we might be able to create them artificially and use them for energy purposes or as materials with new properties. But first, let's have a look at what other strange phenomena those new elements might explain. Scientific literature names double beta minus decay as a rare form of beta decay. The single beta minus decay is prevented for energetic reasons, according to the standard model. Two decays need to happen at the same time. Some isotopes are known for this behavior, others are suspected. As an example, we look at the double beta decay from calcium-48 to titanium-48. First of all, we note the extreme long half-life of calcium-48. Usually, nuclei in this range of the PTE with this many additional PEPs decay faster. Looking at the new PTE, we again recognize the new unstable elements above calcium. There also needs to be a sufficient number of protons, building material, to reach the next viable configuration, in this case calcium-48 to reach titanium-48. Nature can't go to the next viable element with a single decay step. It will fall back to calcium. In fact, the step is bigger than even the standard model assumes. It goes from 19 plus 1 minus 0 to 22 plus 2 minus 2. We actually go up three deuterons and a single proton to reach titanium. But then two outer electrons are pulled in as quasi inner electrons. So from the four PEPs transformed to protons, only two are visible to the outside. Those unstable new elements placed at those positions in the PTE prevent the normal single step decay. Without them, we would not really be able to explain some cases of the double beta decay. The same is true for double beta plus decay. Again, the standard model tells us a single decay is prevented by energy levels. Krypton 78 and Xenon 124 both are with their PEP count below the baseline for the element. The count can only be fixed based on the structure in a symmetrical fashion, in a step of two, or not at all. Again, a new missing element is involved, further decay is necessary. Also, the quasi-inner electron count is corrected. In this case, we step down four deuterons, but only two outer electrons as the other two are sourced from the quasi-inner electrons. With barium-130, a single beta-plus would create cesium-130, which is too light and not naturally occurring. It needs to go to xenon-130. There is no need to correct for quasi-inner electrons in this case. Again we see that the structure provides an insight into what is going on in the nucleus. And the new unstable elements the model predicts provide an interesting answer too. Concluding, we hope to have given a glimpse into what SAM is about and how it can be helpful. The main concept is that the nuclear structure is directly connected to observations and that it delivers an actual explanation and visualization for various nuclear reactions. We looked specifically into a new numbering system for the elements and what consequences follow from the step. We now have to deal with new, mostly unstable elements and we created a new class of electrons, the quasi-inner electrons. However, and that is just an example, the rare cases of double beta decay now start to make sense too. As you could not be here in person, please direct questions to the organizers who will forward them to us. Thank you very much for your attention. So, would anyone like to make any comments or register any questions? As a nuclear physicist, I yeah, I cannot uh, maybe uh, differently. So it is something what uh, contradicts completely nuclear physics, okay, this model. And we know a lot of things of nuclear, uh, nuclear sizes, nuclear masses. What is missing here, for instance, if you 
um, want to propose something new. You should uh, make some predictions and, and compare it with the uh, experiment. Uh, for the first, what is missing, if you say that, you, that the neutron is just proton plus electron, you should think about uh, uh, dipole magnetic moment of the, of the proton and neutron. So you should explain uh, the numbers which are known very precisely, okay? The next point, if you want to uh, discuss structure of, of uh, nuclei, you should think about the formation uh, size of, of the nucleus because we, we know it uh, very well. So most important point is the quadrupole, ele electric quadrupole moment of the, of the, of the nuclei. So because the numbers are known, and if you propose this kind of model, you should be able to, to, to make some predictions about it. It's very easy to do it. It's much easier than to speak about double beta decay, of course. Yeah? So there are some fundamental constants, some fundamental numbers that should be explained. You should explain the masses of the, of the, of the nuclei. And uh, this fundamental thing, because if you want to discuss double beta decay, there should be difference in the masses. This is just this is the energy conservation. So you, if you say there is not necessary to, to follow the energy conservation, this is completely nonsense, I would say, okay? It's a very strong word, but it is uh, important to say. And uh, another point, uh, deutron as a element of the nucleus construction, it is also very strange because deutron is a very weakly bound particle. Yeah, the neutron plus proton, the, the binding energy is uh, about two MeV. So if you look at uh, from the nuclear point of view, uh, the separation between neutron and proton is so high that uh, that is even above the nuclear uh, force range, okay? Um, of course, there is another possibility to, to construct uh, uh, nuclei, and we know that is uh, just uh, real physics, there is alpha particle. Alpha particle is a very strongly bound uh, uh, system, and therefore in light nuclei, you see really alpha particle constituents of, of, the, of the nuclei, but not neutrons, okay? And maybe the last point, uh, so what is also the basic of nuclear physics, it's not only masses, but also magic numbers. It's very simple to, to compare it. And there, there was nothing about it here. Okay, thank you. Well, I started reading the book, but uh, I read only the chapter one. Anyway, I have a question regarding the spin of the neutron compared to the spin of the proton and the electron. Um, spin of the neutron is one half, spin of the proton is one half, spin of the electron is one half, so what's happening with the spins? I guess could be that the inner electron has spin zero, I don't know, maybe, but um, we have no idea about that. So, but I like the fact that it's a crystal structure because I was, my background is crystallography, so I love it, but um, I don't know if it is correct, but I love the model anyway, it's very, very uh, sexy model. <laughs> Thank you. It's also interesting to see that uh, electronic structure of this chemical element seems to be linked to the structure of the nucleus. But and the electrons are orbiting far, far away from the nucleus. So it's, it's interesting. But
I, I would, uh, for those who are interested in following this further, uh, point out that the book by the group has actually been published now and is available. He said and so. Yes, I know. I, <laughs> I'm saying it again. And uh, my commission is very modest, however. Okay, thank you. It's, uh, you can find links to the publisher on Lenar Forum. And the publisher is of interest, actually. Uh, it's Curtis Press, who also published Ruby Carrot's comic book and are uh, bringing out some more works in on aspects of the of the Lenar field in future. So um, the the uh, the publisher is certainly one to court and, and uh, give due respect to. He's taking a commercial gamble on, on uh, <laughs> things which may not pay off. A tale we're all familiar with. Uh, if there are no more questions, I've got a, a comment or two to make because one of the things close to my heart are atomic masses. And though I say it myself, uh, I think I have the best atomic mass model in the world, which predicts uh, atomic masses to, with an RMS error of about 100 kilo electron volts. Uh, that's still 10, 000, 100,000 times, or, or, or even worse, than what we can measure in the masses of stabilized states, because we can measure stabilized states to, a, with a, to an accuracy of less than one electron volt. So you know, below, below chemical levels, in, in fact. So um, measuring and predicting masses is a very, very precise way of evaluating any kind of nuclear model. Uh, so what I found missing from this presentation was the comparison of, uh, as uh, Conrad said, of the comparison between observation and the, model, and the description of the model itself. I think it would be much more convincing if uh, s some tables were drawn up, maybe some, some statistics showing the, the RMS error on, on the predictions of uh, what the model predicts and what is actually measured in the, in the laboratory to see whether it's a good model or not. You need to comp compare your new model with an old or, or, or any, any other established model, any published model, because there, there are lots of nuclear models, let's face it. Um, and I think uh, the, the experimental and the predictive uh, approach is, is a way to, to solve any kind of scientific controversy of this kind. Philippe, I'm, I'm surprised you haven't got anything to say. I was asked to collaborate with uh, Edo Karl, and I asked him to collaborate with me, but um, it failed. So my, my model is based on alpha particles, as you know, as Mr. Cherky said, and uh, so uh, we are in contradiction. Well, uh, I have to congratulate you that you, you can make your comparisons with uh, measured atomic masses, which is something that uh, this group does not do. And I can also do it with a magnetic dipole. But, uh, of course, I haven't shown, I will now show it on, on Wednesday, I have only half an hour, you see. So, uh, I will now show uh, 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 the palladium and, and, and silver. Would you like more time? I have not prepared now. <laughs> <laughs> you okay. have two, two days to, re to prepare. No, because I have not, not my material with me. But, uh, okay, the next, next time I could speak about uh, dipoles, you see, the neutron and proton dipoles and uh, the interaction between them. So if, if you're interested, uh, I, I can do it. It's even on, on the internet uh, for the moment, you see, in, on my, in, on, on, on my web website. So I can develop it. So instead of speaking about masses, because you know that I'm very precise about uh, masses, I can do it, I can do the same with magnetic dipoles. This is another proof of my model, of course. I do not say that my model is the model, but uh, I think uh, my model, with the results I have uh, achieved, is worth or, uh, to, be, to be discussed. This I would like. Great. I would just have a thorough discussion about my model. I do presentations, and I, I think once we should uh, discuss uh, between atomic uh, physicists uh, about, uh, about the results, and I can add, with the masses, I, ca I can add the magnetic dipole, and can 
demonstrate that this is based on my uh, structure of the neutron or the proton, which is based on, uh, um, how do you call that in English, a derivation of the Higgs boson, etc. So all this I can demonstrate. If you, you want the next time, I do that. Okay, so, so let, let's do it. it. Everything is, is there. I have just to, to put it in, in, in music, if I may say, so to be presented. Okay, thank you. Any more comments before we pass on to the next presentation? Which is by uh, David Nagel. Hello to everyone in CC. I wish very much I could be there with you. And I appreciate the opportunity to, pre to make this presentation on branching ratios for uh, LENR. Some background on branching ratios. Uh, we're interested, of course, in what reactions occur. And specific nuclear reactions can result in multiple products. The branching ratio gives the relative probability for each of the possible outcomes. So full understanding of any nuclear reaction requires both knowledge of and understanding of the branching ratios for the reaction. They're also practically important since they determine the products, the ash from energy producing nuclear reaction. And products can be uh, either products or uh, profits, depending on uh, what they are. So we're focusing on one particular nuclear reaction in this talk, the fusion of two deuterons, which has a long history in both hot and cold fusion. So this is probably familiar to you. Two deuterons come together in ordinary hot fusion, as noted on the bottom, and they can produce uh, three different branches, the neutron helium-3 branch, proton tritium branch, and then the true fusion that produces a uh, helium-4 and a 23.8 MeV gamma ray. So it was known early in the field that the usual branch or branching ratios for deuterium fusion did not apply in LENR experiments. Initially, there was the fact that uh, LENR scientists did not die from the radiation. If that branching ratio set on the previous graphic held for the production of watts of power, then there would have been a health problem from the radiation that was emitted. In 1995, a paper by Fox and Bass included the statement that the experimental facts are that in properly loaded palladium, the deuterium fusion produces neutrons a little above background, not many, a greatly less than expected production of tritium, which they call the tritium desert, and much more helium-4 than is observed in hot fusion uh, experiments. So what we need to study the branching ratios for DD fusion in LENR are ratios between the uh, various products, the energy, helium-3 and 4, tritium, neutrons, energetic radiation, x-rays or gamma rays, and fast uh, protons, fast ions. So what I'll do in the next few graphics is show you some available data on ratios between these uh, quantities. The first is Storm's plot correlating helium to heat from 16 different papers. Uh, so horizontally, you have essentially the uh, helium to uh, heat ratio, and vertically, the number of uh, papers that Ed Storms found with the values indicated there. And uh, the black vertical line labeled D plus D equals helium is the uh, 23.8 MeV value expected for conventional DD fusion. So what this says is that the uh, helium production uh, occurs with the uh, release of about 24 MeV and that uh, this correlation has been found in uh, multiple studies. Storms also looked at the neutron to tritium ratios. His first book contains a very useful compilation of 61 papers of tritium production and in about a quarter of those there's a ratio given for the neutron to tritium uh, values and they range from 10 to the minus 9 to 10 to the minus 4. So we have now a connection between some of the branches in the uh, diagram that I showed you earlier. Arata and Zhang produced, as many of you remember, uh, experiments with a double structured cathode. So they had a hollow palladium cathode containing uh, palladium nanomaterials and uh, after the experiment they released the gas pressure, heated the materials to drive off the helium and they uh, produced two papers indicated here. In the first, they stated the ratio helium four to helium three was about four. And then 
A year later, in 1997, they reported a uh, similar ratio to be in the range of 2 to 10. Again, we have connections between the different branching ratios. McCubrey and his colleagues uh, repeated the Radajang double structure experiments and uh, had made helium-3, helium-4, helium-3 helium helium ratios that uh, turned out to be 67 for the metal of the double structure cathode and 18 for the particles uh, inside of the cathode. Energetic particles were measured by uh, Russians, Lipsum and uh, Rosetsky, and um, they uh, did a, uh, an experiment that involved a ferroelectric crystal, okay, it was shown that the neutron to proton channels from that crystal gave comparable nuclear yields. So in the two of these papers, the number of emitted neutrons and protons were comparable. Okay, very, very, very important. So what we have now are four different branches. The first three are the usual from hot fusion, A, B, C, and D, and then A, B, and C, sorry. And D is the L, E, and R, production of heat and helium, just as you saw in the uh, data compiled by Ed Storms. So if you back off and look at these, we have an apparent conflict. The um, compilation of Ed Storms of neutron to tritium ratios shows that branch B is much, much greater than branch A, but the Russians measured those two branches to be equally probable. And then there is the um, neutron to tritium ratios that are so widely varied. The helium isotope ratios linking branches A to D are uncertain by large factors. They range from two up to 67. So again, more research is needed here. But despite these questions, it is quite clear that branch C, normal hot fusion branch, low probability branch is essentially absent or otherwise the gamma rays would be easily seen and branch D is very important. So they, uh, correlation of heat and helium in that branch is extremely significant. Okay, to summarize things, I've put together this diagram in this and the next graphic. So the brown box links the uh, neutron and tritium compiled by Ed Storms. So if the uh, tritium branch in the middle is unity, then the neutron branch on top is 10 to minus 9 to 10 to minus 4. And then using the um, helium-4, helium helium-3 ratios from Arata and Zhang and also Makubre, one can say that the, the last uh, branch, that is the production of helium-4, is either 2 to 10 or 18 or 67 times that very low probability. So looking at this, those are odd ratios for branching ratios, but there is much data on the neutron to tritium ratio, so it has to be looked at seriously. Now, if one instead uses the Russian proton and neutron measurements that give equal probability for the first two um, branches, then you have this situation where the uh, helium-4 uh, in heat ratio is 2 to 10 or 18 to or 67 times the ratio of the other branches. Now, this is somewhat more elegant, but it's only based on three papers. So, to get near the end, the outstanding issues and needed experiments are the following. The data from this project comes from, the data come from a very wide variety of wet and dry LENR experiments, none of which were designed to measure branching ratios. A very basic uncertainty is whether or not the measurements actually reflect the branching ratios of one nuclear reaction or are due to the multiple sequential reactions that might occur on or in solids. So, if you have a beam experiment to determine branching ratios, you can make a thin foil and have a clean measurement. You can be certain that you're looking at the results of only a single nuclear reaction, but that's not the case in LENR. The wide variation in the neutron to tritium ratios can be due either or both to actual measurement variations or experimental variations or differences in measurement. So more experiments and analyses might produce better neutron to tritium ratios. Additional measurements of neutron to fast proton ratios would also be in, uh, very valuable. So some, but only a few of these studies measured the two ratios of helium, uh, I, I misspoke, the two isotopes of helium, 
and more measurements of the helium isotope ratio for LENR experiments are also clearly needed. So in conclusion, we can say that understanding LENR branching ratios is a significant part of achieving a comprehensive understanding of LENR. We have established a methodology for quantification of branching ratios for only D diffusion in LENR experiments. And it remains to be seen if the methodology provides information on single or multiple nuclear reactions on or in solids. Some experimental data were found to begin to determine the branching ratios, as I showed you in a couple of graphics. But the current status overall for the DD fusion reaction is that the branching ratios are incomplete and inconsistent. So we need many more LENR experiments to resolve the important DD fusion case. And we must note that there are many other LENR reactions besides DD fusion that also deserve attention. So if you know of any data that I missed that's relevant to this project, data that gives the ratio of what happens in multiple branches from the same experiments at the same time, I would very much uh, having that uh, emailed to me. So thank you for your attention. I hope this was worth your consideration. So once again, uh, the floor is open for comments and questions. Well, um, the idea of measuring helium-3 and helium-4 is very easy said, but not easily done. I mean, measuring helium-4 is really a problem, but helium-3 is a nightmare. I mean, there's only one lab in France that can do it, maybe one or two in the US. I don't know how many labs can analyze helium-3. This is extremely difficult and expensive experiment, so, but I wish someone can do it. Thank you. I think it was a very nice uh, contribution, very comprehensive analysis. Uh, it is extremely important to study these uh, branching ratios to understand the mechanisms leading to cold fusion or what we want to, to call it, this, 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 uh, this um, fact. So I'm also very happy because uh, this is something that support my prediction I have uh, presented today in the morning. Because uh, finally I said that the helium-4 production should be 100 times stronger or more probable than proton uh, production. So it's something what is very close to that. and. Um, and in my model was uh, neutron production uh, a little bit weaker than the proton. This maybe one half of that. So it is, uh, I would prefer the Russian <laughs> numbers. But it is something what is uh, really very important to understand if you want to, to understand the, the, the cold fusion phen phenomena. So I, I agree with. Uh, with the conclusion of this uh, uh, contribution very well. I thank you. Well, uh, I'm not a, a theoretician, but uh, I want to, to point uh, one fact. Uh, and this fact is uh, the, the splitting uh, in, uh, in three branches uh, of the reaction I is not a cure. It's not like fission. Uh, in fission of uh, heavy element, for example, uranium, uh, there is no uh, uh, energy without fission. Uh, during fusion of two deuterium uh, nuclei, there is production, and you are a specialist of the atomic mass, <laughs> there is a mass defect and uh, there is production of uh, uh, 24 mega electron volt but there's no absolute need for f for uh, fission of the product if the energy goes 
away by a, a, a new process, for example, for, uh, by uh, the way of done conversion of Peter Egelstein, there is no need, no need for uh, splitting of the uh, uh, nucleus of uh, helium-4 uh, from it, uh, uh, formed by the by the fusion, and if the down conversion begin just after the, the the fusion, there is no need no need for splitting. So possibility of uh, of uh, uh, production, uh, uh, great excess of production of helium helium four. So. And uh, it is uh, at the base of uh, many uh, models, and uh, I think it it, it is uh, the explanation of uh, uh, this strange uh, this strange fact. But in fact, it is not so strange. There is the energy, uh, the excess energy uh, in the of. Uh, uh, 24 mega electron volts go away before uh, splitting of the, of the helium nucleus. Thank you. Conrad. I comment, uh, you know, uh, if you produce, um, if, you have, if you study fusion of two deutrons to helium-4, helium-4 is so-called compound nucleus, just as the um, mean step to the production of the of the energy. So, if you produce this excited state of of uh, helium four, you have no energy, nothing. So only after emission of the particles or any radiation, yeah, you can have the energy free for absorption within the sample. Okay. So, just in the first step, if you combine two deutrons to helium, you have New, nothing energy, completely zero, okay? This is just only kinetic energy of two colliding neutrons. It is thermal energy you have. But after the decay of this excited state, you can uh, use the energy for, for, for heat, for different things. And therefore, it is so important that this state decay in charged particles, because the charged particles can be absorbed in the sample. If you have gamma emission or neutron emission, the whole energy will be uh, uh, go away by neutrons or gammas, and they will be not absorbed in the, in the, in the, in the sample. This is just a very simple situation. You, you have only small recoil energy of the, of the, of the uh, ground state of the helium then, okay? So it is, um, I think it is uh, very important to, to understand it. If you're speaking about uh, the, the, the source of this heat excess. And maybe uh, another point. So uh, according to this study of, of storms, this uh, correlation of the heat energy per atom, he said this uh, about 23 uh, mega electron volts, uh, not necessarily 24 mega electron volts, which is binding energy. And it is uh, something also very important, uh, uh, important uh, information. So for instance, in my model, I've said we should look for internal pair production, production of electron and positron, and then the total energy that can be absorbed is not 24, but 23 mega electron volts, because you need some energy to produce electron and positron, okay? So it is, for me, it is very important information here. And I uh, haven't seen it before, so it is something very, very, very interesting. Thank you. But Conrad, in case you have a decay with uh, electron and positrons, the positrons should disappear soon, producing 511 kV. These are photons. 
uh, cannot be detected easily. Very funny situation. Of course, you can um, observe annihilation radiation to 511 kV photons. But the problem is, in the background, natural background, you have very strong line of 511. So it is very difficult to, to come. So what is needed? This coincidence measurement that you are sure that these pairs are coming from the source. Okay, it's not so easy uh, from the experimental point of view. Well, I think, again, I'm going to abuse my uh, powers as moderator <laughs> to make some comments myself. Uh, <laughs> I, I usually do. <laughs> I think what I find uh, logically inconsistent with this entire approach is that Nagel, also for historical reasons, uh, has assumed there's a certain reaction going on, and then he's looking for evidence which proves it. And that is not the way we proceed in science. We look at the evidence first, then we say, what kind of model uh, can explain that? Now, Fleischmann and Pons, way back in 1989, were desperate to show that nuclear fusion was occurring because they had excess heat. That was the only evidence they had. And so everybody leapt on the bandwagon saying, yes, there must be some kind of fusion, but there weren't the, the, proton, there weren't the tritons, there weren't the neutrons, and... Uh, Eventually, helium-4 was found a few years later by Miles and, and so on. And, and this, in the minds of people who had already made up their minds without evidence, this confirmed it. But if we look at uh, Nagel's final conclusions, he says, the branching ratios are incomplete and inconsistent. So really, the branching ratios do not in any way confirm any kind of deuterium, deuterium fusion. And as I mentioned this, this morning, it's extremely unlikely that any kind of fusion, that is to say, uh, tunneling through a, a Coulomb barrier to, prevent, to, to make uh, energy, can be a, a possible solution. And the reason for that is we expect the PD reaction to be dominant. And I'll come on to that in a minute because I'm going to be the next speaker. <laughs> Okay, I agree with you that PD reaction that emits uh, gammas, okay, this proton capture reaction on neutrons, it has a much smaller reduced mass and therefore exactly. the cross section at room temperature, at thermal temperature can be, we have calculated already it 10 years ago and this was published in the ICCF uh, conference. It is, I agree. But the problem is uh, not only that, yeah, that uh, you have gammas and it is not necessarily what we want to have because we cannot uh, absorb gammas in our, our energy source. Okay, so it is much better to have neutron neutrons and produce helium uh, or alpha particles. Uh, much better is, uh, I think, what we have presented today in the morning is uh, our reaction on lithium because we have helium-3, helium-4 and this uh, clean. It is a very nice situation and we know exactly the branching ratio, there are no resonances. In the case of in, uh, helium-4 DD reactions, there are some resonances that uh, brings you some uncertainty, you, know, you cannot say exactly, yeah? but here you have no resonances a very clear situation and you can calculate all the things. What is very difficult, it is to measure it at, at so low energies, okay? At different, in different media. This is something what we want to do, but it is excellent new energy source if the cross sections are large enough, okay? But it is something what, is, uh, uh, what makes the screening energy, screening, screening effect. Screening effect is so strong you, you could see, so if you study the, the reaction in metals, they are stronger by a factor 10 to 40. So it is just comparison between the size of this uh, lecture hall to the whole universe. And we can calculate it. This is the same as you, if you want to calculate the time, uh, lifetime of alpha decay. We can calculate, and there are 
a lot of, a lot of differences. This is also 10 to 40 orders of magnitude. We can calculate it, okay? And this, in principle, no problem. There are some details, yeah? But uh, it is something what, what works, okay? Okay, I have to answer that. And uh, <laughs> what we want and what nature provides are two completely different things. Let's not confuse human psychology with nature. And the second thing is, of course we can calculate it. And your, your calculations as presented this morning by your group are perfectly correct. But there's another calculation you've, mis you've uh, overlooked, which is the calculation of the rate of the PD reaction, which is about 14 times, 14 orders of magnitude faster than any DD reaction at least DD to helium-4 compared to DD, PD to helium-3. So if there is no helium-3, we could be quite sure that any helium-4 was not produced by, by any cold nuclear fusion. Therefore, there must be another reaction or a series of reactions which are producing helium or tritium or neutrons which are not cold fusion. Because if there was any fusion at all, it would have, there would be a Coulomb barrier to tunnel through and there's no evidence for that. No, yeah, there's evidence in your, in your hot fusion experiments. I'm, I'm talking about cold fusion. No, because you can extrapolate it down. It is the effect that it's known in, the, in the astrophysics very well. For okay, but so one of the examples for that, how it works, it is so-called Hoyle resonance. You know, there's main resonance that uh, explains uh, um, carbon-12 production in the universe. Your needs for that very special resonance level in carbon-12 at uh, special energy, and what you need is also screening effect. Otherwise, you couldn't measure anything, or you, you couldn't see any carbon in the universe, and we couldn't participate in this uh, conference because we are made from carbon, carbon okay? So, there is, uh, so this kind of physics works, and we know exactly that screening effect how strong it is. So I, I uh, shown you today that we have predicted t 20 years ago the numbers, uh, how strong is screening energy in, in I, metals. I, I don't dispute your, your figures at and, all. Your, your experiment is also you know, correct. So we have, uh, we have measured correctly uh, under ultra high uh, vacuum with clean, pure metallic targets. And then finally we've got to our surprise, that the screen energies are much lower than we have measured previously. Okay, not higher, but lower. And this is something what is, uh, for me, was for me also very surprising. Okay, but it means that we can calculate and predict something uh, with some consequences. And you have, in different fields of physics, there's not only one thing that I wanted to say you, yeah, that is uh, in, in, uh, in astrophysics and plasma physics, uh, even in hot fusion physics, this uh, screening effect plays a very important role. So it is something what is under control. Okay. Yeah? Uh, I think uh, Philip is the next person. Thank, thank you. Yes, actually, if you. You said something which is very important. I think if you allow, I can address this in my, not tomorrow or the day after, but uh, I could do the following. I agreed with George Egerly uh, this morning to write an article in Infinite Energy. I could then uh, expose the whole of my theory. And you can all read it. If you agree, it's fine. If you do not, we discuss and we can present it the next time. But we should be uh, actually uh, ready to accept one thing, a symmetry between mass and anti-mass through dark mass. Higgs boson, etc. I will explain it. You can say it's not true, it's only a theory, it's only my idea, okay. Maybe we can dis dis discuss it, but for me it's clear, I have figures and I have results. That's all I can say. And what I will present on, on Wednesday is just a little part, a little part of my theory, which is more in interest of the LENR, of course, because we are more inter interested in binding energy than in, uh, in symmetry uh, of a higher degree, of course. 
So uh, we do that. Okay. I think question time is overrunning my own talk, so I've got to <laughs> have to cut short this <laughs> quite soon. I want to answer to Conrad. I mean, in uh, electrochemical react experiments, the surface is never clean. So maybe you should work with some dirt on top of the palladium that will increase your screening potential. Good. Yeah, yeah, I agree. You should put some oxide layer on top of your palladium. I wrote a paper with a couple of people regarding oxides at the surface of the electrodes, increasing the reaction rate. Okay, well, I'll call upon the next speaker, please, to, um, to present uh, the difficult relationship between theory and observation. <laughs> um, I think it was... Um, um, Peter Hagelstein, who said, a th someone's theory is like a child. You can't criticize someone's children <laughs> without incurring their wrath. And I'm sure I'm going to do that <laughs> tonight. However, um, I have a thick skin, so I'm going to go ahead anyway, because I think we really need to discuss the nitty gritty of theory and experiment. Excuse me, can I go share with uh, YouTube? With yes. uh, Zoom, one moment. Vedi se il video auto, eh, chiedi di attivare il video al relatore. Se no va bene così, dai. Tanto l'audio si sente, spero. Ok. Penso che si senta l'audio dentro, vero? Vai, vai. No. Avvio? Claudio, avvio. Avvio il video, sì. Il mio, sì. Ok, prova. Fai avvio il mio video. Oh, ok. Claudio si sente perché si vede il microfono in questi What is the purpose of theory? It's to provide an explanation, to provide useful predictions. And a successful theory, at the end of the day, should lead to progress, acceptance, and of course, financing of, of Lena. So this ought to be in everybody's interest to, to, uh, to, to find an appropriate theory. After more than 30 years, very few, if any, models attempting to explain condensed matter nuclear science have achieved acceptance outside its pro proponent, or proponents, usually these, just, these are one-man bands who propose uh, their theory, and every, so every few years they tend to change their theories, which makes things even more difficult. And conversely, very few experiments actually set out to test these theories. Many models fail to illustrate um, what, they, what they predict and, uh, or explain. Uh, and I've said this many times at these conferences, and I'm beginning to, to need to say it more, even more forcefully than once I did. 
And the worst thing of all is that almost every model, including all the models I've ever sustained personally, predict residual radioactivity of some kind. That's not to say that the author of these models predicts it, but if you read what their model, the, the, the basic physics of their model, they do predict it. So how do we go about testing theories? We can look for expected fuels and, and products, and helium-4, of course, is a fairly ubiqu ubiquitous product from any kind of um, nuclear reaction, any class of nuclear reaction, I should say, including fission of uranium, of course, but, uh, and including uh, fusion of, of deuterons. We could use uh, chemical and physical or calorimetric methods, but they're not really very sensitive, and they tend to have a long time constant. Furthermore, the, uh, the, the instrumentation to measure excess heat tends to shield the apparatus from nuclear measurements. So we don't expect uh, too many uh, lower energy gammas to get through a, a water flow calorimetry um, situation. Um, to get around this, people have used um, uh, CR39, isn't it, um, to, 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 to um, examine particle tracks. And this plastic can be inserted inside an electrolytic cell. But even so, um, there is some shielding. We could use uh, gamma ray spectrometry to measure gamma energies, intensities, and any decay rates, if indeed it is a decay. They might be prompt gammas, of course. We can look for isotopic anomalies uh, by mass spectroscopy. The next question is, is it cold fusion? Fusion implies the approach of charged particles tunneling through a Coulomb barrier. I mentioned this problem just a few seconds ago, a few minutes ago. By far the most probable reaction is a proton and a, a, a deuteron producing a gamma and helium-3, as uh, Conrad said. Um, this reaction is about 14, time, 14 orders of magnitude faster uh, given, uh, given a, a constant uh, distance between the, the, the nuclei um, as the d plus d going to helium-4. So if we're proposing that there's any helium-4 formed by deuteronic um, fusion, we expect 14 orders of magnitude more helium-3. And this implies, given that any uh, heavy water or heavy uh, or deuterium um, experiment contains a small amount of proteum, um, but it's not one part in 10 to the 14, that, uh, that the helium-3 reaction should dominate in all circumstances because we can never purify heavy water to, to, to one part in 10 to the 14. So absence of helium-3, or rather, um, the absence of dominating helium-3 implies no Coulomb barriers. And that is an extremely important uh, uh, conclusion. I think it might be co uh, compatible with your uh, model, uh, Jean-Luc, Jean because uh, you have an electron very, very close to a nucleus, so effectively you have no charge on a, helium nucle a hydrogen nucleus, and therefore, there is no Coulomb barrier. So that's a way round this particular objection. So I, I, would, I, I praise your, uh, I praise your, uh, your model. The next question, this is this uh, question about the nuclear active site has been raised by a number of people, but particularly by Ed Storms. And I would just um, re repeat that it's well established that chemistry, any chemical structure, temperature, pressure, and any physical uh, conditions don't really change rates of nuclear reactions. Now, of course, this is not true in a, a fission reactor, where it's not the structure, but really the, the components present which are important. And the, there is a small uh, variation of, of rate of fission uh, based on temperature, for example, but they're rather minor effects, quite honestly. Furthermore, we notice that leather appears to continue in hot spots long after any melting. The hot spots are very large, and consequently, uh, if the first nuclear reaction had caused a tiny bit of local melting, which you could not even see with a, with a, with a, a microscope, it ought to stop. But it continues, and the, and the heat production continues in the same place. Now, the, the, melting, the molten metal 
surely destroys any chemical or physical structure. So I think that the concept of a nuclear active site is completely wrong. Structures are not important. Uh, this is an example of uh, a hot spot, and you can see it's about uh, 100 microns in diameter, maybe a little bit more. This is uh, on the surface of uh, some nickel, uh, and we uh, made the Met Bow on the, at the bottom right-hand corner is the Department of, uh, um, of Metallurgy at the University of Bologna, B for Bologna. And this was made in 1996 in Stromanus' laboratory. Um, that strange, those strange granules at the center of the uh, electron micrograph are, is actually a eutectic of um, tin and nickel. Uh, at the time, we had no idea how uh, the tin got there, um, but it doesn't matter. It, this, um, this eutectic demonstrates that the temperature must have exceeded 1,000 degrees, which was well above the three or 400 we were heating the nickel to. So 700 degrees over a large hotspot is incredible. So how do we weed out all the wrong theories? And I, uh, I have one particular method um, because it, it suits me as a computer programmer, which is to, to use some software to see how the model behaves given any uh, naturally occurring isotope in, uh, on Earth, I can almost say in the universe. Any Natural on Earth obviously means stable isotopes. And so I, I'm going to apply this, uh, this test to some well-known uh, models. Uh, the widom larsen model, which invokes heavy electrons, storms hydrotons, and also electron capture. The Iwamura-like captures of alphas, uh, deep Dirac levels, Fischer's polyneutron theory, Barjutov's Erzion theory, and my own theory but I'll be talking more about my own theory on tomorrow. According to the widom larsen theory, electrons are conjectured to acquire energy. They become so-called heavy electrons. Sufficiently energetic electrons can be captured by protons to produce neutrons, and the neutrons being neutral don't see any uh, Coulomb barrier, and they uh, um, acti activate, or they get captured by uh, anything which happens to be in your, uh, uh, in your s setup. The trouble is we know very well that neutrons uh, usually activate and produce residual radioactivity, which we don't see. Uh, Widom and Larsen uh, tried to get around this by saying, oh, but the electrons are very special and they absorb any gammas, in which case they should demonstrate they can absorb the gammas. They can't just make an ad hoc assumption that, uh, which gets, gets round the objection. They must demonstrate it. They have not done so. Uh, Larson, I think, passed away a few years ago, so it's not surprising he hasn't done so. But I think um, Widom is still alive. There are 65 naturally occurring isotopes which have become beta radioactive on capti capturing a 78 kilo electron volt electron. And that's long before these, uh, any protons would capture the electron. Surely there are more electrons which have less than 780 keV than there are which have more. So there are all sorts of secondary effects which are predicted by the theory which the authors have completely overlooked and they haven't taken account of. Uh, the lowest energy such reaction, of course, is uh, electron capture by helium-3, a bit difficult to demonstrate perhaps, but it ought to produce tritium but the energy required is far below 780. It's actually 19 kilo electron volts. But there are 65 other similar examples. So there's something drastically wrong with this theory. Um, Storms also invokes electron captures as a kind of multi-body fusion. He, um, he assumes that uh, there's a standard uh, structure for, uh, for um, the, the fusion of hydrogen... Uh, isotopes, uh, which involve the capture of an electron. So the first one at the top, uh, which produces eventually, according to this theory, helium-4, goes via an intermediate hydrogen-4 uh, uh, reaction. But we know that hydrogen-4 normally decays in about 10 to the minus 22 of a second um, into uh, tritium and a neutron. So the absence of fast neutrons and fast tritons 
would be very, very obvious. And of course, the fast tritons would then um, uh, um, cause secondary reactions. Triton and, and a deuteron in a deuterated environment would produce more fast neutrons. So we'd expect, we'd expect a lot of fast neutrons. Um, all these reactions are, of course, weakened reactions, which by definition are uh, inhibited by about 20 orders of magnitude. So they're extremely improbable, but Ed Storms, not being a physicist, um, I don't think appreciates this, this limitation. Uh, just, just to make, um, to contrast those reactions with what uh, a nuclear physicist would probably propose uh, without any weak interactions at all, the PD goes helium-3, as I've mentioned, the, uh, the, the, the deuteron fusion goes to uh, uh, tr tritons and, and helium-3, uh, two protons, would produce a positron, which we noticed by the 511 keV uh, uh, anni annihilation gammas. We don't see we don't see these things, so they don't happen. Then the, um, the um, Ed ten tries to get round the, uh, the the difficulty of electron capture uh, because um, it, it would produce radioactivity. Uh, by invoking bolepsis, which are the so-called bursts of low-energy photons. Uh, but there's no model uh, which actually explains how you get bolepsis. He, he's suggesting there might be thousands, perhaps tens of thousands, of um, um, uh, gamma-ray photons coming off at, um, at such low energies they don't escape the apparatus. You know, so again, it's, it's just ad hoc. Um, solution. He suggests that the, uh, the helium, the hydrogen-4 beta decays, and you would, you would expect um, uh, Serenkov radiation for that, which again is not observed. I do recommend, if you're doing any electrolysis, um, that you go into your laboratory at night to see if you can see any Serenkov radiation. You, the naked eye will detect it. <laughs> you don't need any particular apparatus. Um, we don't see the positrons, which usually uh, occur concurrently when there's electron capture, at least at these kind of energies. And multibody fusion is, quite frankly, not very likely. If positron emission can, can occur as, as a competing mechanism, it usually does. So now I want to pass on, uh, we're still discussing um, uh, Ed Storms, who also invokes Iwamura-type multibody fusion by uh, multiple deuterons. And in this um, notation, I've used beryllium-8, which corresponds more or less to, to four deuterons. And uh, Iwamura did, um, detected this first reaction because he, he showed that the praseodymium-141 could, could be uh, co formed from cesium-133. And it's mildly exothermic, but obviously with four deuterons, it's extremely exothermic to the tune of about... 55 uh, million electron volts, and many other products ought to be formed because the whole thing would put Frank Abend to, to these enormously high energies. But let's just let's take, it, uh, take this with a pinch of salt and ask, well, what happens if we get Iwamura-type reactions in palladium? Because everybody's using palladium. And uh, the, the prediction is we get radioactive tin and radioactive uh, germanium with nickel. We don't see these. So I conclude we don't have this kind of reaction. So I don't know how Iwamura got his results, but it doesn't quite correspond to what we observe. Um, we can, we can uh, see what happens when beryllium-8 fuses with every existing natural isotope. There are some 250 uh, such uh, isotopes and 181 of them are exothermic, and 70 of those 181 produce beta radioactivity. So we, exp we expect ubiquitous radioactivity, but we don't find it. Uh, I've got an example here uh, with, of calcium-40, and I used calcium-40 because Iwamura claims to have a layer of calcium oxide in his, in his system, and we expect radioactive chromium. And as I, again, as, as I say, we don't observe it. So now we pass on to um, uh, Jean-Luc and uh, Muhlenberg's deep direct level model. Um, a deuteron and an electron 
Um, I should use your, your notation of a, H bar, a D bar for this, but I've used um, a more, more standard notation. It reacts with most palladium isotopes, creating uh, radioactive silver. Again, we don't notice these, um, these predictions, so I'm a little bit doubtful about this. And let's, let's pass on now to the, another question which is frequently raised, which is the, the heat helium-4 ratio. We saw that graph um, in uh, Nagel's uh, presentation a moment ago, showing uh, a peak around 23 or 24 million electron volts. Actually, there's quite a lot of variation there. If you examine the, the graph carefully, it's on a, a logarithmic scale, so actually a very wide and, uh, variations are compressed in, into what appears to be a very narrow band. It's not like that at all. And this would only be significant if only one reaction were occurring. So if there were some uh, reactions, for example, in the light hydrogen system, which were not using deuterium, these would interfere. So <coughs> I, I don't think the, 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 the heat-helium ratio is at all significant. We expect multiple reactions. We almost certainly do get them because uh, the Oomura type uh, fusions, for example, are an example. Um, we don't expect, in any circumstances, a 24 MeV uh, ratio. Um, there used to be a time when I was a very strong um, proponent of Fisher's polyneutron theory. Um, the trouble with this. <laughs> And I think I realized it, but you know, when you get enthusiastic about a theory, you, you tend to suppress your, uh, your, um, your worries. The thing about this is, uh, if polyneutrons existed, and they, they just passed into some heavy water, which is quite a dense concentration of, of deuterium, you would expect a runaway uh, chain reaction uh, of the kind uh, we see at the bottom here. Um, N here is, is a neutron, A is a, a polyneutron of, of mass number A, and it just goes on growing and growing and growing and growing, getting bigger and bigger. Uh, I think we would notice the deuterium would start boiling away, or the heavy water would boil away. We don't see this at all. As far as we know, heavy water is fairly stable. And uh, Bajutov's um, Etzion model, which is also rather similar to the polyneutron model, um, predicts uh, a negative Etzion, and um, this would react with... Um, uh, lithium-7, uh, sorry, uh, uh, an anion, the, 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 uh, let me see. This would react with lithium, which is present in a, in a large number of setups, to produce a, a negatively charged particle. Possibly, it's in red, which means it's a, a radioactive particle, and effectively that would withdraw from the system all the, all the uh, etzions, and because a negative particle, a heavy negative particle, would be attracted immediately to any nucleus. And so, effectively, it would, it would just stop the, uh, the, any, any, any reaction at all. Even if it decays, it's going to decay off in a matter of minimum seconds, surely. And that, but, you know, if you withdraw your, a, 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 a very few number of particles who take... Uh, seconds to regenerate, you're not going to get any, any, um, cold, any uh, nuclear anomalies. Oh, so, and then we have the, 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 the solution which solves all known problems. Um, it borrows from the Fish and Bajutov models um, and bypassing both the, the previous objections. And I'm going to present that, uh, I think, tomorrow, so uh, I won't say any more about it. So, in conclusion, all models predict residual radioactivity, as including my model. If the expected radiation is not found, I say gammas because the gammas are very easy to, uh, to detect, uh, the model must be refined. Any valid model must make more predictions and, and, uh, than assumptions and, uh, or parameters. This is absolutely fundamental in statistics. You, you, can't, you can't predict... Uh, 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 two or three reactions uh, if you're going to then invoke uh, dozens of parameters to, to explain it. And it's not acceptable to ignore established nuclear physics laws without some very good experimental reasons. So thank you very much.
Well, you mentioned these radioactive elements. I looked at them. The fact is that they are very short-lived. And most of the time, they, you, they're not, they are not producing gamma rays after that. So be beta emission or electron capture. So you will never see anything. That's why you don't see it. You should check okay. in details each one of these elements, you, you, what you, they produce. You know I have uh, the software to do these checks, oh, yeah. and I have checked, and, I, and I'm right. No, you're wrong. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I don't need a, a software for that. I need the table of elements and with the radioactivity, the, uh, the, how but they you, behave. You haven't, you haven't done the test to see how the interactions are with it. Um, I, I analyzed the palladium, and I saw yes, yes, silver. Exactly, no, exactly, but that's different. That's and the silver you produce is very a very short lifetime, and there's no gamma production after that. So you never so see. So there, sh there should be prompt gammas in that case. If they're short lived, they should be almost prompt. No, it could be electron capture. You would not see anything. Yeah, I don't know. Okay. But I don't think you will see any gammas. I, I think at the, at the final session, we can, we can discuss this again. Okay. I'll, try, I'll right. try and find some data right. in, in the meantime. I will, I will look at my numbers. I will tell okay. you more. <laughs> my issue with my observations and reviewing a lot of historical documents is that there seems to be a, a penchant for looking at things as two-body two interactions. Uh, and this was the way that Matsumoto began. And in, he, in 2001, in fusion technology, he admitted it was millions and millions of nucleons that acted together in an electronuclear collapse. And this is what S.V. Adamenko uh, found, and he called it electronuclear macro, macro cluster. And it's also what um, Leclerc found with his partner using both laser-stimulated cavitation and sound-stimulated cavitation, where you've got very, very large numbers of nucleons into some sort of quasi-electronuclear macro cluster. They collapse and you have a stellar type alpha conjugate nuclei product coming out. Um, so these debates about, <laughs> and, and when you do the reaction tables, you get what he observed in 1990 in his palladium deuteron, the actual fission products, the, and they're all aneutronic. You get the baryon number on both sides the same, and you just have a physical lump of matter that's coming out with the kinetic energy. And you get the heat, but a lot of the products are helium. So I, I wish people would talk about <laughs> cluster decays and, and large bodies of, of matter interacting okay. simultaneously. Okay, let's talk about this privately later, yeah. or, or even in a group, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay, I agree with you in the most points you have concluded, okay? Thank you. <laughs> but uh, in one point I cannot agree with you. So, first one is that um, uh, screening effect is just established, uh, very well established. So, if you argue that uh, we should use established science, this is something what we should use, okay? And this is just uh, proof for that, that, um, that nuclear reactions are sensitive for, uh, let's say, chemical, uh, um, uh, chemical processes, for solid state physics, for atomic physics, for plasma physics. So we know it. This, so the conclusion of storms is not correct. Yeah. It was made uh, uh, 30 years ago or some, some uh, so it is, uh, I think we should think about it, okay? Because at low energy, the, this interplay between atomic physics and nuclear physics is very strong. Okay, so it is first point. And um, what I wanted to say more, you asked, speaking about this uh, radioactivity and short-living isotopes. But if the short-living isotopes are there, the, um, that uh, it means that they are very, very uh, intensive if you look at for the decay, because the number of decaying gammas is much higher and it is much easier to detect them uh, compared to long-living uh, isotopes. Okay, 
So it is not if we should see some gammas, if you want. Okay. So, and the next point, um, uh, this uh, argument about uh, PD reaction. The cross-section uh, at thermal energy depends very strongly on the screen energy. So if the screening energy is, let's say, above, I don't remember exactly the, the numbers, but we can look at uh, our publication that was 13 or 14 years ago. We calculate for different screening energies already there. And uh, the PD reaction cross-section is higher than DD only for very low screening energies, not for high. For high energies, for high screening energies, DD reaction is much stronger. So the conclusion that there's a special number, let's say 10 to 14, it is not correct because it depends very strongly on the screen energy. Okay, so we can discuss it and, and uh, this uh, important conclusion to that. This in any cases, the, if, we, if, we, if I discuss about electrons um, resonance in the directions, it depends also very strongly on screen energy. So it is very strange, but very simple physics, okay? And we should include it in, in our predictions, in our discussion as well, okay? Uh, following the way the suggestion of um, Jean-Paul, I think we have to watch deeply about a reaction that apparently don't give radiation, like electron capture. So maybe it's a, a way to follow. It's just my idea. I have a direct question for Conrad. How do you explain the plethora of observations of palladium producing, or titanium, or whatever is in the Lenner reactor, producing a spread of elements uh, typically either side if they're light elements or look like fission at the, at the lower energy? Uh, uh, you are asking about transmutation, mm -hmm. yeah? And it's very difficult to explain uh, physically it, it because uh, you need some processes that can, produce, can be produced, or oh, maybe there is something like fission, yeah, that, uh, or you can speak about many neutrons that are captured and produce different isotopes. But from simple uh, nuclear physics, it is not so easy to understand. And, and, and the, what is important to calculate the cross-section for that, multiple uh, neutron capture, you know, this, the cross-section is so low that it's um, not easy to understand the processes. Maybe somebody can come and say, I can calculate it and, and show that is the case. But in my opinion, there are some problems from the experimental point of view, because usually there are some contributions, components, and ingredients on, of the, your sample. Uh, even you use so-called pure, uh, pure samples, you have some constituents some isotopes that are inside of, of, the, of, the, of the samples. And then uh, if you um, heat the sample a little bit, you have a diffusion. And it is, uh, it is diffusion which is compl uh, can be very different for different isotopes of the same element even. There's, there are very nice examples, for instance, for enhanced diffusion of oxygen-18 compared to oxygen-16. Oxygen-18 uh, goes to the surface, and then you measure uh, unusually high uh, amount of oxygen-18 at the surface, yeah? something very simple because of diffu diffusion. So from the experimental point of view, it's not so easy to, to measure it. Yeah? So you measure different elements, and it is, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> So I would refer you to the work of S. V. Adamenko, um, 600 man years of experiments in the isotopic laboratory outside of Kiev, 300 dual discharges into ultra-pure pin targets with an ultra-pure accretion disk, 
and there were whole blobs of nearly pure lead or 86% gold or like, and these were basically not even present. Lead was the most easy thing to make. <laughs> Yeah, so they, they used iron ablation and they cut down and they showed as they went, went, went through the, and if you, because of the orientation, you have the impact and then you have things spreading out so you know it came from the impact. <laughs> yeah, it's not contamination. That's why they had the accretion disk. Taking the opportunity to have George Egli with us, uh, George, you explain that if you make a work Arc, uh, arcing in with carbon electrodes in water, you get some iron, no? Iron and the rest of the periodic table. <laughs> I can speak to that as well. So, um, um, Bokris and Sundaresan in the 1990s, they did carbon arc discharge underwater. And they found that they got iron, and they said it was uh, two carbon, two oxygen, going to four helium and iron 56 or 54 or something. The other idea is you get synthesis of aluminium from, uh, I think it is carbon and nitrogen, uh, because it's dissolved in the water, uh, or, and then you get two silicon, two silicon fuses to iron 54. Um, my understanding now is that the oxygen is important. They identified that. They, what they did was they, they boiled the water to remove the oxygen, uh, that removed the nitrogen and the oxygen. They then oxygenated it, and they found that they synthesized iron. When they did the opposite, they removed all the gases from the water, and they, they saturated it with nitrogen. They didn't see any iron production. Okay? And I believe that's because oxygen is uniquely paramagnetic, and anyway, we get into magnetic monopoles, and they uh, allow the clustering that forms the, the material. But the material balance uh, leaves no doubt about it. Oh, ab absolutely. And, and the, the carbons, I, I've seen the synthesis as well. And yeah, anyway. Okay, I think that's the end of the session. See you tomorrow. And supper, of course, is at half past seven downstairs. Dinner tonight is at half past seven. <laughs>